Hello, and welcome to the Setting Trick Podcast. Bridge players, are you looking for a way to introduce the beauties of the game to your non-bridge playing friends? We have a new version of Double Dummy, which will be finished next month, which is just the ticket. If you're tired of hearing people go on about the Queen's Gambit and you want to see a similar boon in bridge playing, sign up for our email list, learn about the free ACBL screening that we're going to be having next month in June. If you want, you can give feedback on the film. We're not quite finished. We're still refining some details. Sign up for our email list. Go to doubledummymovie.com and learn how you can introduce those friends who've been saying they want to learn bridge for all these years and get them to a place where they're going to want to take lessons. They're not just going to want to learn from you. They're going to want to take lessons. In the film, we have two of the youngest ever life masters, Adam Kaplan, who inspired Double Dummy, and Richard Jang, who was inspired by Adam's journey as the youngest life master to set a new record. On today's show, we have the three C brothers. Bill and Doug were the 10th and 12th ever youngest life masters, respectively, in the history of the American Contract Bridge League. And their older brother, David, was a big part of their journey to that esteemed place in history. So this is intimidating. I have the famous Heist brothers. How, how do you say your last name? C. C, like ABC, like the letter. C. Like ABC, yep. Really? Yep. Non-phonetic. I was never going to get that. No, <laughs> and if nobody worry. ever gets that right. <laughs> if you had gotten that, you would have been in, in, the, in, the, in the point oh one percent These guys don't even play bridge anymore. I'm not sure why we're having them on, but they're <laughs> affable. They are committed to the technology and making sure their appearances. We've had all sorts of exciting chatter. Anyway, welcome. And it's great to have you on David, Bill, and Doug. Hi, C, Doug C. Yes, there you go. Well, actually, the interesting thing now that we're older folks, Bridges actually become very popular. So my wife plays. She's got all her friends playing. I mean, it's actually become like quite a social thing. <laughs> and of course, it, it's actually a talent that is now worth something. All those years when you were a teenager and in college and everyone looked at you sideways, now all of a sudden it's actually got a little bit of social capital taking bridge player. Who knew, right? <laughs> that might be sad, actually. It probably is sad. It means we're old. Yeah. So do you play Well, do you play with your wife then, Bill? Occasionally. I do. I play, I play a little bit for fun and play. I do little to help people. I teach a little or do little you know, things for our, our annual auction event. I threw an event for a bunch of years where we gave him tips from what I remember. I played in the fall nationals with your wife. Yeah, we okay. We played in the nationals too. We did we, we played a little bit every once 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 every couple of years. When it was in San Francisco. Oh so you guys did play in the fall nationals the twenty nineteen uh I think it was twenty eighteen actually. It was San Francisco. So what year was that? It was that we played with my my aunt who's something years old and then she and then actually she passed away like a month later, or a couple months later, yeah, like a month later. So. Well, well, let's. Yeah. The, the origin of this conversation is both Bill and then Doug both set the record for Life Master, and David also earned the title of Life Master at a young age of sixteen. So let's talk about Bill. You became the youngest Life Master. Was that something that you intended going for that? We were definitely going for it, yeah. My parents got divorced when we were maybe nine or ten years. When I was nine or ten years, the day was twelve, and Doug was six. And then my father finally decided to go back and play bridge, a serious bridge, not social bridge. And so uh, David, I'll give David. David was the one who got us all started because my dad had a, uh, he was playing a club game, and so he he brought he brought Dave along. And there was a uh, tournament next door. Dave, why don't you finish that story? So, yeah, no, I, I would just, you know, I was hanging out with my dad at 11 years old or something. And one day they were short a player and I knew how to play, but not like seriously. But one day they said, we're short a player. Do you know how to play? They were sort of desperate. So I'm like, sure. And I think that sort of opened up my dad's eyes and he said, I'm going to teach you to play. 
And so we played, and then of course, you know, older brother, younger brother, younger, younger brother, yeah, you, know, you gotta follow. So that got Bill started and then and then that got Doug started. And then all of a sudden we were uh we were a bridge playing foursome. Doug, we haven't heard from you yet, the uh, classic youngest brother. What's your memory of all this? They were playing, and I wanted to do whatever they wanted to do. So I would go over to my dad's house and um, honeymoon bridge. So the two of us would just play. <laughs> and then eventually, very early on, um, we were playing honeymoon bridge, and I psyched. And my, my father was, like, so amazed that I even, I, <laughs> like, I could do that we're going to go play in a club game and see how we do. And so that, that was how it started for me. And that's when he learned that psych doesn't always work. <laughs> <laughs> the very first thing that Doug had to learn, though, was how to hold his cards. Now you think, well, that's not that hard. But when you're six, you have really small hands. And so, you know, like holding a, holding a hand is actually not mm. that easy. It makes total sense that your parents getting divorced, that that ended up being the catalyst that got your dad to like teach you all bridge. Yeah. Yeah. That was the catalyst. My dad was a outside of the box thinker. And so, <laughs> you know, at that point in time, there really weren't kids playing. There was uh well, there was a few that had played before us. And so he thought maybe we could really do this. And so he started like he was apt to do, take it kind of seriously and really try to teach us how to play the right way. And, to, and so we, we got a lot of exposure to, a lot of his good thinking and others and, and learned how to play well. Were were you guys or was your dad good friends with Alan Truscott? Because when in researching you all, you guys got a lot of the New York Times bridge columns. I thought it seemed like maybe there was a friendship uh, friendship there. Yeah, no, they weren't. It's a small community. I wouldn't say they were good friends. We had a really good PR firm we hired. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Actually, in a, in a lot of ways, it was the reverse. We started playing, and there was, especially when we started playing, there was immediately a lot of attention. The the club and the ACBL, they all wanted to publicize it as a form of PR. And I was, I think all three of us were pretty shy. I didn't really love that, to be honest with you. But they kept on, you know, they kept pushing us to do more and more PR. And by the time I was getting close, because Billy had broken the record already, Every tournament I went to, I was interviewed, you know, by the local newspaper. I was on television, and it was it was a real it was Probably. really overwhelming for me. So the truth is, you know, if you think about it, right? Poor Alan Truscott had to write a column every single day. Like, imagine if you had to do a podcast every single day. After a while, you start really running out of ideas. So I think that was part of it. How old were you when you played your first uh, club game, Doug? My first. Club game, I, I had just turned six, I think. You were six. I just had turned six. And actually, my first club game, I sat down, and the first round, the people, the couple that we played looked and said, this is a joke, right? <laughs> You're pulling a practical joke on me. And we kept on saying, no, it's not a practical joke. And they almost didn't play against us. And then... I hope you beat them. We sat down against a very, very elderly woman. And she looked at my father and said, this is a joke, right? And he said, no, this is not a joke. And he, she said, listen, I've been playing bridge 50 years and I didn't get this far so I could lose to somebody who can barely see over the surface of the table. And she refused to play against me. And we called the director and the director was like, okay, well, we'll just give them two zero. I mean, you know, you can just imagine, I was like, I was six. I was like, what is going on? It was, I was like, man, they won't, they won't play with me. It looks like, you know, you go to the playground and it's like <laughs> two kids won't play with you. It's like, what? So your dad, he was the one who took you to the club for the first time. Yeah. And then that session. No, I'm taking credit. I taught him how to play though. That's true. My brother, Bill was the one who actually told me, taught me to play. <laughs> so your dad started it. And then was there like a snowball effect? We like, we weren't playing a lot in the early days. You know, we would just play at the club once in a while. And then you know, my dad started to go to like sectional tournaments and then regional tournaments. And he had, you know, other partners, et cetera. But after a while, I think he, he figured out that like, oh, we could all play. So then we started to play as a family and just it sort of went from there. And then he, he sort of got the bug, you know, and then we started to travel and sort of get really into it. Yeah, but he had actually an active bridge career outside of us. I mean, we were doing school and doing other stuff. And so for us, it was a weekend or, you know, 
we would go on trips to do it, but we weren't playing every day by any means. We had tons of other stuff we were doing. Would you play at home as a foursome? Like when did that? No, never, never, never. Really? I mean, maybe early on, very early on, but after that only at the club, really. And when did you start getting master points? I made it when I was probably, I was a junior master when I was nine, I think. Doug was probably six, six or seven. I remember playing in a club game maybe a couple months after I started playing. I think I finished like fourth and I got 0.07 master points. And I was super psyched. (laughs) So what was winning, like 0.3 or something? Yeah, I don't know. Something like that. And and so, David, did you go for a Youngest Life Master and just miss it by a wide mark? No, uh... no. I mean, I got, uh, you know, I think actually I ended up being like fourth or fifth Youngest Life Master. So that's like a double asterisk. By the time I sort of really got going, it was like, it was like way too late. We just started playing. And then uh, I think we realized that Bill could really make it. And so, you know, that's sort of what really got things going. How how long do you think you've been playing when you heard about the title of Youngest Life Master, Bill? Oh, I mean, we probably knew about it when I was about 11 or 12, but by, probably 11. And my dad was that kind of a thinker. You know, he's, once he got it in his yeah. head, he's like, oh, we, we can do this. And these kids are good enough to play and they can do this. You know, for him, it was a little bit of an experiment because, of course, the idea of a kid playing bridge, I mean, there were a few people that had had done it before, but a very small number. And he really thought that it was possible. And so it was a little bit of an experiment from his perspective. He thought it was possible. He thought it would be really good training and really good education for us and kind of an interesting challenge. And so once we got it, it was possible. We all bought in and that was it. We were... We went for it pretty hard at that point. How much did it ramp up once you had that as a goal? Well, you know, look, during the school year, you can only play so much, right? I mean, we were all doing the school thing, but it was pretty, pretty intense schooling. So we were, but all summer we would play, you know, we would go from one end of the summer to the other. And then you could kind of see that if we did it the right way, we could make it. And you know? what was the lineup? <laughs> Good question. I guess David and I, I don't actually, I don't know. David yeah. and I played a lot together. And then at the end, I guess, I think it was more Dave and, I don't actually don't know, do you, it was you and me and Dave and, and Doug and Dad, I guess. And then by the time Doug was old enough, he had already been playing with all these guys, you know, for a few years. So he didn't need sort of quite the jump start, if you will. He was more raised into it. Were yeah. you jealous when Doug beat your record, Bill? Uh, no, not at all. You know, we, we didn't hold it all that tightly. And then I think, in fact, it became really a family goal. We wanted him to beat it by as much as possible to, to make the record as hard to beat as possible. So, and, and at the time, it was, you know, he was almost two years younger than me. He didn't just beat it by a little, he beat it by a lot. And we knew it, he was going to do it. It was no question. It was, it was obvious very early that I had, my record was not going to stand for very long. It's an interesting thing when you do anything from the time you're that little, it really does become a part of your brain. You know I mean? We were doing it from such a young age. Like you dream and bridge, you you know, and all of it becomes just like part of your whole psyche. Yeah, and actually, I was in Iowa when I was nine, and there was a slam that we ended up with a four zero break with the Jack Fourth offside. And if that hadn't happened, we would have won that event, and I would have been a life master at nine. Wow! So I think I took eighteen months off the record when I did it. And I it would have taken, I would have added like another 18 months or something like because that. Because you needed like, like the event was that many points or you needed the gold points or? I think I needed the gold points. I think that's what it was. Although I had a lot of gold points. I think it was just in those days, it was very hard to accumulate lots of points. To be a life master, it took 300 points. And I won an event in Kentucky, and I think I got 28 master points. I mean, and the field was like, like, I don't know how big it was, but it was like 16 or 17 sections. It was a few hundred tables. Your recollection of bridge history from like six and nine years old is pretty remarkable. (laughs) Yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah. I mean, that is the thing that I did, though. I mean, you know, Billy's recollection is that we went to school, but. I almost didn't graduate from fifth grade because I took so much time <laughs> off playing bridge. Yeah, he, he was really serious. I was just a hacker. 
<laughs> that's that's the thing. Like I made this documentary movie, which is how this podcast got started. And it's like that's the other side of bridge that you can't tell people about. <laughs> so it's potentially it's just gonna throw everything in your life out the window because you're gonna become consumed <laughs> yeah. by it. Yeah. And so that's like the dark underbelly that maybe is why Doug's son has all these chess trophies. Chess is much more accepted. Uh, sorry, sorry the, the listeners yeah. can't hear us, but I, I can. We, we're on a video here, and Doug's is in his son's room, which has got chess trophies out the wazoo. And we were <laughs> lamenting that Doug's son is playing chess and not bridge. Yeah, I don't know how that happened. I couldn't get him to play bridge. Did you try? Yeah, but he wanted his own path. Like he didn't want to live, you know, and it's true. I think if even now when I go and play in tournaments or I play, you know, first of all, I make everyone feel really old because if they remember, then, then, then they're by definition really old. And, and number two is, I don't know. I think that there was a group of people who play bridge and, um, I sort of represented what was possible or that they thought was impossible. So it was, it was an interesting moment. It's not, it's not like today where, you know, there are a lot of youth players. There's a whole youth program. I mean, like I didn't see a person that was even in the same range of age until after I became a life master. So I, I never, and I remember there was this one time we played in Philadelphia and we played against another family and the daughter was my age. And then they, I think they had two brothers. So their two brothers played against my two brothers and her dad played against me and my dad. And I think we beat them like 64 to three. I, in a seven. I was going to say, I think we kind of destroyed and then, them. And then, and then they quit. Yeah. And then they moved. The and, and I don't, and I never saw them again. <laughs> and I remember saying to my dad, gosh, I really feel bad that we did that. <laughs> and he was like, I don't feel bad in the least. No, that's actually encouraging because like the, the story goes that bridge is dying and it's so old, but really we have a lot, sounds like we have a lot more young people playing today than we ever have. So if that's the case for you, like in tournaments. Yeah. Actually, yeah. there's a gal out in, our ba in the Bay Area, Debbie. Zuckerberg, and she's got this whole youth movement, and there's lots of young players. And actually, she went, I knew her when she was a high schooler, and there's a bunch of kids who learned to play bridge that I would play with, and they got hooked into it, and some of them ended up becoming professionals, and I always say that ruined some of their lives, I'm sure. But Debbie was part of that crew, and she actually now has a whole youth movement out here on the West Coast that's, I think, very successful, so it was to her. Yeah, that that you're talking about Silicon Valley Youth Bridge. Yeah, they're they're really like the model. We're not in New York City. They're the model. We're not in New York City. So she was a New Yorker. We made her way down here. So it's impressive. So what, what was the so Bill is the person that I've been communicating and setting up this interview. What what was the email threads like amongst you guys, David? Because originally I didn't want to interview David. I didn't even know about David because I saw you know the names and lights. That's okay. I kept saying like Bill C, youngest life master and partner. And there's Doug C, youngest life master and partner. So I, I'm and partner. He's, he's used to it a little bit. But he's the whole reason we got started. So we have to give him some props. Yeah. Yeah. One of my questions was, do you play amongst yourselves any, any, anymore? Like, Definitely not. When we're on vacation. No, we don't play. Oh, no. When we're on vacation oh, that's as true. a family. That's true. that's true. You know, mostly because Bill's wife, you know, really likes to play. And so, you know, so she'll bring a deck of cards and she'll be, okay, we got to play. And so, yeah, we'll sit down and, but, you know, it's cutthroat because it's like three brothers and we don't care about the score. We just want to beat the other one. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you, how do you, do you cut for partners? How do you choose partners in this situation? Yeah, cut for partners. Actually, we cut usually let, don't we usually let Amy decide? Yeah, it's just going to usually Amy yeah. picks her partner. And, then, and for know, some reason, it's not me. I don't know why that is. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? It's never Bill. Who do you think's the best? Well, you know, Who do you think's the best of the three of you? Uh, well, we're also supposed to say at the same time, definitely me. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Doug, yeah. Doug, um, Doug had a uh, subsequent, you know, once I started working, I really stopped playing. But Doug actually 
continued to play a bit afterwards and actually took a year off and, and basically played professionally. So he actually has a, he had a little time where he, he actually played more seriously as a career for a little bit. And I, and I still play rubber bridge for money. So where do you do that? I, well, I used to belong to the Regency whist club and then there were some clubs here in New York and they have like one table and then I just go and join the game and just, get into the rotation <laughs> Play, playing for pocket money playing for mad money it's funny because it said you preferred yeah. rubber bridge in one of the alan truscott articles from like 30 40 years ago really? it's funny that really? you're still that's still your thing yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 i i, I enjoy rubber bridge it, there's much less commitment and i i find it a lot more challenging having random random uh, and the rewards are better partners. <laughs> and the rewards are better yeah yeah. Actually, the truth is, between the three of us, we all had somewhat different playing styles. So, like, best could be different, you know, depending on sort of which which thing you're talking about. Yeah, it's a great window <laughs> into your into somebody's mind at how they play bridge. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. You David know, David is a, David is a marketing guy and marketing executive kind of by training, and uh, and he plays like a marketing guy as you think he would, you know, kind of. Yeah. Very creative. Creativity of, is at the forefront of, 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 of it all. What's an example of his creativity? Oh, well, whenever well, the last time I played with David, I was just trying to make sure we didn't end up in a four-two fit. That was my main. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, when we were yeah. young, we we would play. We we were all a little a little wild. You know, I mean, we were young kids. We, you know, we're all in experimentation mode all the time, and so. We did a lot, you know, we all declared pretty well. And so we just would, you know, and we also learned from some people that, you know, guys like Ron who were amazing match point players and very much masters of the psychology of how do you take from the players that are there and, and feed their mistakes, you know? And so that was a big part of how we played. And so we would go through these periods of we were a little uh, out on the edge and we'd play a little bit on the edge. But David more so than the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, 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 for yeah. sure. But my, our dad was like, he was like a very rigid thinker. Like he, he definitely was like foresighted, but like when you had a system, he was very, very into the system, you know? And for a while, like we played these super complicated bidding systems and, you know, all these conventions and everything else. And I, I, I hated that actually. So you see, David's favorite partner of all time is oh yeah, my favorite partner of all time was Ira Rubin. You know, his nickname was the Beast. And Ira loved to play four card majors, which would just screw people up all the time. And it was like a whole different system. And I loved doing that because it sort of appealed to me that we were playing in a way that nobody else played. They couldn't figure it out. Everything they knew sort of went out of the window. And, you know, like you'd have these sort of bidding things and you'd figure out that they missed a slam in the suit that you opened in because you were short and they didn't know that's the way you were playing. And, you know, you see it had all these kind of fun things. Yeah. It was also kind of natural, you know, I mean, it was four card majors and kind of natural bidding wasn't adorned with all kinds of stuff. And of course, Ira was one of the all time great card players. So, you know, he, was, he had a lot of success with a very simple system. No, I know the name. How do you think it, ha- how did it first happen? Whereas like Bill said to David or David said to Bill, I'm guessing and not Doug, like, let's go to the club and play the two of us. Do you remember that, how that happened? <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good question. I think the honest truth is my dad was involved in all of that. You know, we were kids. Yeah. What did we know? Yeah. My dad was, he had a vision. And so he, he was very, you know, he would organize things. One of my kids is a, is a golfer. And, you know, he, he now plays golf in college. But we did this whole junior circuit. It's very much like that. Like, the parents have to kind of organize the whole thing. It's too complicated for a kid, you know? I mean, we just had no clue. We were just like, go where we were told and <laughs> yeah. play where we were told. And, you know, and so my dad was definitely... Uh, he was the planner for sure. sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he was, he, was, he was a big planner. So he was very good at it. So what was the custody agreement that your parents had? Was there any sort of, you had to spend certain nights at each other's house or was it just sort of yeah, free? Yeah, we were in the city. So, you know, like it was pretty flexible. Yeah. But mostly we lived with my mom and we would spend weekends with my dad. And would you go to the club on weekends or would you go weeknights or? Uh... Weeknights, I think, were a rarity. We're more of a rare, a little more of a rarity to 
the school. Well, in the summer, summer we would go okay. all the time. All the time, yeah. During the summers, it was just, we'd go from tournament to tournament. Yeah, and by, and by the time Bill was going towards Youngest Life Master, I mean, in the summers, we were traveling a lot. I mean, and we were going to local tournaments in Pennsylvania, <laughs> Connecticut, all over the place. Um, oh, then we started to go all over the country. And then we started going all over the country, yeah. So you were kind of an afterthought in that, Doug? You didn't really think about the fact that you would want, I mean, when did the... No, it, it were, were was... Were you being groomed? No, it was discussed from the day I sat down. And, you know, as soon as Bill was like, was going for the life master we had already been it was discussing. inevitable yeah it was it was that. inevitable yeah <laughs> it wasn't yeah. a question it was inevitable yeah and it wasn't just yeah. a question of whether he would beat my record it was by how many years there was no question it was gonna be yeah yeah and so i already had a lot of points i mean i was already getting close you know i was getting closer and closer by the time bill broke his record so i didn't i don't think there was a question at that and Doug was coming to all the tournaments with us, so yeah, he was playing. How would you describe your dad's playing, bridge playing, uh, career or record? Did he? Did he? Was he like a Grand Life Master, or did he win any uh, NABCs? Uh, he didn't win an NABC. I mean, he was a Life Master, and he kind of prioritized us. <laughs> I mean, he liked playing. But, you know, like once we just, you know, like once Bill was going to go for Life Master, like that was the priority. And then when Doug was going for Life Master, that was the priority. We were all just, you know, kind of help make it happen. I think he was a very good technical player who had three sons who were his partners. And we were not that great, especially at the beginning. And so he really sacrificed his bridge <clears throat> career. I, I, I don't think there's any doubt that he would have won a national championship if he had focused on his own game instead of ours. If he had spent the week in, uh, on an island with John Mohan. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, you heard, <laughs> you heard about that story. Yeah. That was when you, you got, you got cut off. I actually, that week that we spent with, was it a week bill or two weeks that we lived with, uh, Oh my gosh. Yeah. With yeah. Ron and Bunny Haas. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised so, we survived that. That was like a, that was like, um, was pulling a, us to be a, a truant. <laughs> yes. Again, I don't know how if you knew Ron at all, but he was a very, very <laughs> colorful guy. And you can imagine him and you know, he didn't, it's not like he had kids or whatever. And you know, he was a three pack a day smoker or something. I mean, he was just, you know, and he had <laughs> anyway. So my dad sent us out to go. I can't remember what the circumstances we were. We were no, no, no. It was between tournaments, and instead of going home, yeah, right, yeah, right. We were gonna go. Yeah, we lived with him. That's right. That's yeah, right. but but the thing was, he had like congestive heart failure, and so he was basically bedridden for half the time. But then the other half of the time, he felt like, okay, well, I got to make make up for it by doing things <laughs> that I don't think any parent would be very proud of. <laughs> Including that time, I'll, I'll never forget, we went to the supermarket and Ron goes down the cereal aisle and he just starts randomly opening boxes of cereal and eating a little bit of the cereal and then putting it back. And I remember going to the grocery store with my mom and thinking, who the heck goes and eats, like opens a, a box of cereal at the grocery store and then puts it back? Well, it turns out it's Ron. So that's that's what he was like. Oh gosh! Yeah. How yeah. old were you when when you spent this two weeks at Ron's house? Probably nine or ten. I think I was. Yeah, yeah, I was nine or ten. Yeah, yeah. And we came back, and then it was like, oh, you're never staying with Ron ever again. <laughs> and we loved Ron. We loved Ron. He was. We loved great, Ron. A great person, yeah. but he did teach us a few little things that probably little kids shouldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> whose idea, do you remember whose okay. idea originally it was to, like your dad said, like, were you involved in the decision or your dad just said, you guys are going to go spend two weeks? <laughs> no, we're just we're like, we're just with Ron, yeah. I remember him like parking illegally and he said, here, watch this. And then he got out of the car and he started limping like he was handicapped. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember. I'm like, whoa, okay, yeah. new check there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. That was part of that trip. Yeah. 
<laughs> that was that was so funny. Yeah. Yeah, and we all learned how to swear pretty well from it too. So. What yeah. did your mother yeah. think of your recounting these stories to her? Oh, oh she, didn't, she didn't. She didn't know anything. anything. Are you kidding? Yeah, we wouldn't tell her anything. It was a totally. Mm-hmm. Good. She didn't know about. No it. She didn't know about any of that. No way. Yeah, that would have not. Uh, that would have made things harder for everyone. But your mom did play bridge. She was actually playing a hand when Bill was being. Uh, well, man, somebody really did their research. Yeah, well, it's in the thing. Wow. It's in yeah. the thing. I, this is where I show off the research. Yeah, the, that was me the day after I became a life master. I played with my mom. Yeah, no, no, no. But mom was a yeah. social player, and actually, the reason my dad gave it up yeah. originally was mom wasn't very good, and it was like a it was a it was a cause of marital strife. So, you know, they would play at like friends' houses for parties and stuff. But yeah, they didn't like my dad didn't want to play anything more than that because, like, you know, the whole husband wife thing it was not it was not a good scene my mom told me this story that when she went into labor with me they were actually playing bridge and they were in a slam and my mom said my water just broke my dad said can we finish the hand <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah. yeah exactly and her answer was no which probably tells you why they were <laughs> together oh because i read it said that when Bill, when her lay, water broke with Bill, she wanted to continue playing the hand. I think, I think that might have been that might have been revisionist yeah. history. Maybe, yeah, <laughs> no, that's okay. I don't my, think so. My mom passed away this past year, so we're not we're only going to say good things about her. She's great. Yeah. <laughs> she seems like a, I mean, what a woman! Wow, reading her, yeah. I mean, she was a powerful, uh, a powerful figure. Yep. Yeah, she, she was an amazing person. Too, so. But not that involved in our bridge careers. Definitely my dad's uh, uh, handicraft. But I would say that her influence on us in terms of how to be successful, how to fight through problems, you know, those are all things that we learned from my mom that I think were instrumental in our success playing bridge. So, Yeah, I mean, I get goosebumps just hearing you say that. Yeah, I, I reading her, reading about her, because Bill told me in some of our early communication, he told me that you had lost your mother on December 20th. Or, I found that in the obitu- yep. obituary. But I wanted yep. to to learn about her and reading about her. I was, it was really, yeah. 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 Yeah, thanks. And it was probably a good thing that she wasn't paying a super amount of attention because basically <laughs> your three young sons were hanging out with, you know, all of these adults in smoke-filled rooms like all these glory spots around the United States, you know, I mean, Pocatello, Idaho, and Lexington, Kentucky, and Iowa City, not you know, is there any of those places that are actually all perfectly lovely. But, you know, that's kind of what we did in our summers was we, you know, we'd go from tournament to tournament and, you know, they're in some interesting places. I hesitate to think about how much secondhand smoke. Oh, my God. Know. I mean, again, I don't know if people remember what it was like before they got rid of the smoking, but it was... I mean, you would come home and you, you would, would just speak. smoke you yeah. like a cigarette. Four hours of, you know. Oh, it's eight well, to 12 hours a day, depending on the sessions, right? You know, and there was like, there, yeah. you know, when we started playing, if I remember right, there was no non-smoking and smoking even. It was just like, you showed up at a table, like two-thirds of the tables were smoking. Yeah, and as a little kid, I remember, like, you'd walk into the room and they're like, especially if there were low ceilings, like, there was just this haze. You know, oh, yeah. Haze. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, it well, and every table had an ashtray on it. Different childhood. Not the environment <laughs> most mothers probably picture their kids in. <laughs> so you guys never no smokers in the no. in the group no. here. No. no. <laughs> After all the second hand smoke, we, we none of us needed to. <clears throat> yeah, right. exactly right. I remember being in a in a car uh, when I was a kid, and my uncle was a smoker, and he was smoking, and the windows were up. We were parked, we were waiting, and the windows were all up. And I'm just like, oh my god, I'll never do. That. <laughs> yeah, That's right. yeah. Was pretty much that was like, like the break of every day, you know. <laughs> yeah, and again, sometimes you'd be in like these, you know, like hotel ballrooms that really had low ceilings, and that was the worst. You know, at least if you had high ceilings, a little bit more air, but. Or like at the Beverly Bridge Club, yeah. the old Beverly Bridge Club. Oh, that was just a total smoke pit. Yeah, a smoke pit. 
so this is for our advertising for bridge it can show you the the errors you know you, <laughs> none of no smokers in this group in spite of being exposed to all these smokers exactly. and i think bridge <laughs> is like one of the last last bastions of smoking yeah. in the world like you, you go to the term like to an nabc and people will be complaining that the smoking area is so far away from the the uh, and the fact that there even is a smoking area it's like, <laughs> yeah. that's how, right, that's right, how right. back in time uh bridges i have to say it has been interesting to me because at least in my area there's a lot of people who want to play you know and, and it's a sign maybe of just my age and state a little bit but um people are kind of into it and and it's not just us it's like even my cousins are That's playing true. my, yeah. I mean, our, our aunt, my grandma, my mom's sister, who was, uh, who passed away last year, she was really into it. And so and she really wanted to come and play at the nationals, which is like a totally bizarre concept. She would want to do that. Or yeah, we all are, a lot of people are playing and people are still playing. It's just the older set. What event did you play in in San Francisco? I think we played in the side game one day and then we played, Two side games. I think we both played inside. Games. I got a good story from that though. So I was sitting at the table with Bill's wife as we were playing together, and some old dude kind of, you know, ambles over and he goes, Are you David C? And I'm like, Yeah. And I'm looking at him, and it's just an old guy, like a nameless, faceless old guy. Well, it turns out this nameless, faceless old guy and I played together in a, uh, we played in a midnight Swiss in Las Vegas, like, whatever it was 40 years ago and we won the event bill had a crush on a girl i won't name her and so we finished like <laughs> playing whatever the like the real event was and he's like okay i really want to play in the midnight swiss with this gal you know will you do it i'm like sure but i gotta find a partner and so she had a friend and so and he wasn't very good at the time and i said sure what the hell so the four of us played a midnight swiss and I actually had a good day. And so, you know, despite the fact that like my partner was a relatively novice, we were just crushing people. It was awesome. And Bill had googly eyes. Like he was playing with this girl he was hot after. So, you know, he came back, he goes, well, we have a couple of good results. We have a couple of like not so good ones. And they were like, 10. but you know, we managed to win and we won the event. So that was good. They never, they, they didn't stay together though, despite the fact that we had this sort of miracle win. But anyway, the, the guy was my partner. And, you know, we had this hand where we got into a creative, let's just call it a creative slam. And I basically had to do a double finesse when somebody wasn't paying attention so that they didn't split. Right. And that was the only way to make the hand. And we did. And that's basically why we won the event. And this guy remembered that hand from 40 years ago. <laughs> so it just goes to show you, you know, it's like there, there are a bunch of people that are still out there. Yeah. That is, that is really strange. I was on a business trip in Las Vegas, and they were having the Nationals in Las Vegas. So I don't know what year that was, but that was a few years ago. And and so I went down. I, I just happened to be staying in the same hotel where the Nationals were being held. So I went down. I think they were playing the Spin Gold. And I went down to go, like, see if I knew anyone. And there were all, all these people that I knew. It was it was really it was interesting. Really old. But every <laughs> Yeah, and everybody was like, "I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm more depressed at of how old I am, or I'm more depressed at how old you are." Like, they just couldn't wrap their head around how old I was. You know, I, I saw Bobby Levin, who you know, like, and you know, Bobby was like in his twenty. Yeah, he was a young well, guy, was like a young, young kind of studly guy, right? And he was like, a, you know, one yeah, of the hottest yeah. up and coming players, and. And, right, right. and Ron Smith, I saw Ron Smith and uh, Ron looked good, but he was just, he just couldn't believe it. He was like, you're how old? What? Yeah, what? our memories of these people are frozen in time a little bit. From right. Time, right? You know, yeah. so these are all guys, you think of them as like young guys or some of them even like in their early 20s. And now, of course, some of them in their 60s and 70s. And yeah, it's a different, it's an interesting thing. So, Bill, when you quit, was it kind of like conscious or just work? Just so Doug and I, uh, we both. I worked for an investment bank, and I was working 100 plus hours a week, and there was just no chance. Though, even during that time, I did. My dad was sick, and I did basically take a little small break, and and that's when I did those junior world championships. Was 
was during that time. So I was basically out of playing. I was in my 20s and I was working really hard, but somehow or another, I managed to creep out a little bit of time. And I did like this mad dash training thing and played a couple times uh, at, at those two tournaments. But pretty much I, other than that, I didn't play at all. You know, I was just working too hard. So, you know, your career takes over and I'm kind of in a defense profession. So it's, it wasn't, you know, it, it's like anything else. If you want to do it well, you got to play. Is, and, is your uh, company called Bridge something? Uh... Bridge Street Advisors, yeah. yeah. So it's a boutique investment company. I saw that you worked at a place called Bear Stearns, Bear Stearns. and I was like, the must, this yes. must be, this must be this. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, I did. I did. I, I did. I did play there. And it's actually a funny story because I actually, I was going in, I'm a, was a tech investment banker and I was going in there and I had been recruited by somebody that I had, that was working there. And so I, I called up and I, and I said, I should probably just let Jimmy know I'm coming in. And, uh, you know, I hadn't seen him in 15 years or something like that. And so I call him up and of course, you know, Jimmy is the CEO of this pretty big company, he picks up his own phone. I called him like six o'clock and he said, Oh my gosh. Yeah. And I said, you know who I am? He goes, Oh yeah, I remember. And then he called down to the trading desk to go, you know, who Warren Spector is, you know, he's, yeah, sure, yeah. Warren's been playing recently. And he, and he gets, he says, I got, he's Warren there. He goes, no, Warren's sick. He calls up Warren and Warren's at home. He calls him at home. He goes, Warren, I, look, I got Bill and Bill was also the king of bridge, just like you. And, and Warren, of course, is like home ill. He's like, well, he, I mean, it was, he must've been like, what the heck is this? But, but anyway, I did end up going to work there and, and, uh, you know, uh, Jimmy's a great guy. So I, I was there for quite a few years and, Really enjoyed it's a great place. Is that where you were working? Because because they've got a bridge culture there. Is that where you were doing the hundred hour weeks, or was that after that? That was before then. That was before then. I, that, that, I went to Bear after I'd been in the industry for you know, seven or eight years already. And did you get recruited by bridge players, or was it totally no total coincidence? Mm. Total coincidence. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, in fact, after I accepted an offer to become an investment banker at at uh, Dylan Reed, which is where I started my, I was in the analyst program for the investment bank. I, I took that year off and I was training for the um, junior world junior bridge championships. And I played against not Jimmy, but Jimmy's mm -hmm. wife. And we got all done. And she, she looked at me and she said, Oh, we just started talking about like where, where I was. And I said, Oh, I'm, I'm going to go become an investment banker. And she looked at me and she's like, what, you're not going to go work at Bear Stearns. And I said, no. And she said, Oh, I'm going to have to tell Jimmy and he's not going to be happy. <laughs> and, and then I, and then I, I didn't really think too much of it. And then I was walking down the hall of the bridge tournament and Jimmy comes up from behind me and he's like, why are you not working at Bear Stearns? What is wrong with you? And he was with, uh, I think he was with Alan Sontag, who I, I'd known since I was a little kid. And, and uh, they were just laughing their heads off. I mean, he was just like. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I need to explain to our listeners that Bear, Jimmy Kane was the CEO of Bear Stearns, which who's a huge bridge lover. And uh, Bear Stearns had this culture of like hiring bridge players for years and years. I mean, they're, I think they're, a lot of it was built like Warren Spector, who was the president of Bear yeah. Stearns. Like and he then was Ace Greenberg, and Ace Greenberg, who's also yeah. a good player. So, and there's more too. There was a few more. There were a few more of us. Weinstein, Steve Weinstein. Yeah. Oh, I didn't, yeah. I didn't, yeah. I didn't know he worked there, but yeah. Anyway. Um, it was a great place. <laughs> you were there for a long time. Until the bitter end. Oh, so when you had this phone call with him, you were coming in to work. I was being recruited to work there. Oh, so you ended, literally called. This, you literally called Jimmy to tell him you were getting recruited to to work there. Yeah, I thought it would just yeah. be that you know, just be a nice thing, and so yeah. Wow. So that kind of, I mean, that that's pretty good connection to have, like to be able to call the CEO of a place where you're getting recruited just because you don't want to upset him. <laughs> You know, that he doesn't well, I just know. Thought he should know. I don't, he didn't know me that well at the time, you know, but I just thought it would be the right thing to do. Yeah. And, and it was, there was no strategy around it. It was just like, no, I get I it. I get it. I get it. And, uh, 
yeah, but I was there for a long time and yeah, so I had a, mm. had a good career there until, until the bitter end, so to say. Mm. Well, that must have been uh, tough. It was an interesting experience, not recommended for most people. <laughs> <laughs> not my favorite. Gotcha. <laughs> but gotcha. So the next generation of bridge playing C's. What are we? What are we looking at? We don't have any breakers of Andrew Jang's record. From in spite of Amy uh, <laughs> liking the game, doesn't sound like he's got any <laughs> promising. Uh, you know, they all ended up having all. their own pursuits. Yeah. We're going to have to go. We're going to have to go after the grandchildren. I think. Yeah. Are you guys related to Tony? Nope. No. We're not. Mm. We're not. How often do you get asked about youngest life master versus related to Tony? These days, related to Tony <laughs> way more often. Nobody even knows that we were bridge players. <laughs> Maybe our yeah. friends do. But Although, bit. you know, Tony is a brother. His name is David. And his mom used to send me emails to him every once in a while. We obviously have an email address that's pretty close. <laughs> and so, you know, I would get, oh, and it, they were great. They were like classic mom emails. David, I haven't seen you in a while. Uncle so-and-so is a little sick. I'm going to go see him on Thursday. When are you coming over for dinner? You know. Should have accepted. I know. <laughs> yeah, the Tony, he was a legend. A friend of mine wrote about him in an investment letter before he died. And then I he died. And I was so surprised because he, he was so, like, what he did at Zappos was so yeah. amazing. And then what he did for downtown, uh, you know, downtown, no, downtown Reno. Right? Was it Reno or Las Vegas? No, Las, Las Vegas. Oh, Las Vegas. Anyway, but, you know, he's, he's, he did a lot of interesting things. All right, well. Thank you all for doing this. It's been fun getting to meet you. I'm excited to know how to pronounce your last name. I feel like I have it internalized. And, uh, you know, uh, thanks. Thank you. Well, you're Thank welcome. you. Thank you for yes, having, having us. Making it happen. Yeah, this is great. All right. Well, we'll be publishing it probably in like a couple weeks' time, and we'll do a transcript, awesome. and it'll be on our website. And uh, hopefully we have recordings of most of it. And uh, yeah, I'll send it to Bill. And uh, all righty, sounds yeah. great. Thank you very much, John. Really nice to meet you. Nice right. John, thanks. Nice talking to you. Thanks. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Likewise. Hope Cheers. to see you at the table. Yeah. 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 We, we talk sure. about it every once in a while, like get, getting the band back together again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's an idea that has occurred to us. Yeah. Austin. We'd have. We'd have to go and train. <laughs> Most of us have forgotten how to play a little bit. It's a competitive family, <laughs> I can see. You don't want to show up and, and embarrass. I would not want to embarrass ourselves. Exactly. Really. All right. All right. Well, thanks a lot, guys. All righty. Take care. Bye-bye. It's exciting as the host of the show to get to meet a family of bridge players like the Seas. And one of the things that Doug said was that when he was playing, there were no kids playing. So in that sense, we're ahead of the game. We've already got multiple organizations that are doing a fine job of introducing kids to bridge. Think about Silicon Valley Youth Bridge, which uh, Andrew Chen is the youngest life master. He came out of their program. And then another program you might want to consider is Bridge for Youth. Bridge for Youth has virtual summer camps for multiple levels of youth players. You can get a just somebody who doesn't even know the cards, or you can get Tom Carmichael teaching advanced players. For more information on Bridge for Youth summer camps, check out our website at thesettingtrick.com. And remember to sign up for the Double Dummy email list so you can introduce your friends to Bridge in a meaningful way. Thank you.